Hi everybody, welcome along to this. This is part 15 of the Attenborough readings and I shall get straight into it in a moment. They're travelling up a, a very remote river, encountering some native people in the different jungles of Guyana and doing some filming and also trying to collect animals. And the last time we met, uh, they had just collected this parrot chick which they've been feeding. So we're going to read on and I've got more difficult pronunciations coming up. By the time we were nearing the Pipilapi, I'm going to go with that. The village at the head of the river, we had bat bartered beads from macaws, tangers, monkeys and tortoises, as well as several unusual and brightly coloured parrots. So if you remember back, they had different coloured beads, which are basically like a currency acting as money, and they're swapping those beads for all these different animals that they're collecting. The most unexpected of our purchases was a half-grown peccary, a wild pig of South America. The villagers who owned him seemed quite glad to pass him on to us for a comparatively small quantity of blue and white beads. At the time, it did not occur to us to wonder why. We soon found out. Yeah, if anyone's going to get rid of something for a low price, you've got to be suspicious. We had not expected to acquire such a large creature as Peccary, and we had no cages big enough for him, but he was quite tame and we naively decided to give him a little rope, collar, and attach him to a cross stay in the bows of the canoe. This, however, was more difficult than it would seem, for the Peccary, roughly speaking, tapered from his shoulders down to his snout, and it was soon apparent that no normal collar would stay on him for one moment. We therefore tethered him by... how did they do it? They tethered him by tying a rope harness around his shoulders and forelegs. This, we thought, would be enough to dissuade him from trampling over other things in the canoe. Houdini, as we very soon called him, did not share this view, and no sooner were we on our way than he lifted his forelegs one at a time and with ease slipped out of the harness and picked his way down the canoe to begin eating the pineapples we had brought for our supper. He's called Houdini, by the way. Harry Houdini was a famous uh, escape artist who was very good at getting out of things, just like this pig apparently seems to be. We were disinclined to stop and make other arrangements to secure him, for we had to reach the Pipilipi that night, and our engine, as King George expressed, was a humbuggy plenty. So for the next hour, I did my best to restrain Houdini's explorations by clasping his bristly body in an affectionate embrace. Basically sort of hugged him and tried to hold him back from the pineapples. At last we reached the Pipilapi. The village lay ten minutes walk away from the river and was one of the most primitive settlements we had so far seen. All the men wore loincloths and the women bead aprons. Their few circular huts were ramshackle. In fact, here you go, look. A tame crested carousel. I don't think we've met them yet. Just trying to see, it's got a fantastic looking beak that gives you an idea of the sorts of huts where these people will live in as well. Obviously very basic conditions, but perfectly good for them. Anyway. And carelessly built, so talking about the huts. Some lacked side walls, like the pitch you just saw, and all were built directly on the dry, sandy ground instead of having floorboards like the huts at Kukuiking. Here, as at every other village, King George seemed to have a number of relatives, and our welcome was cordial. There were parrots here too, but in addition, we saw a large crested carousel. I'm going to go with Curaso. Or so, strutting among the huts. Again, these sorts of videos I've said always go away and Google these things and have a little look at them in colour. Um, but it certainly that was the picture you just saw of him strutting among the huts. It was a glossy black turkey like bird with a handsome top knot of curly feathers and a bright yellow bill. We learned that he was destined for the cooking pot, but the villagers found our blue beads irresistible and glad gladly bartered him for six handfuls. There were no vacant huts in the village, so with King George and Abel we slung our hammocks in a hut that was already occupied by a family of ten. While Charles prepared the evening meal, I fondled Houdini and treacherously tied a new and elaborate harness round his shoulders as I did so. I then tethered him to a post in the centre of the village, put a pineapple and some cassava bread at his feet and exhorted him to lie down and go to sleep. The night was not a good one. King George had not seen his relatives for some considerable time, and after, long after nightfall he was chattering away, exchanging gossip. At about midnight, a child suddenly began screaming and refused to be placated. Then one of the men climbed out of his hammock and restoked the fire in the centre of the hut. At last I managed to get to sleep, but it seemed that no sooner had I shut my eyes than I was being shaken by the shoulder and King George was saying in my ear, De hog, e loose! We'll catch him when it's light, I murmured, and turned over to go back to sleep. The child started howling again, and the unmistakable stench of pig filtered up my nostrils. 
I opened my eyes and saw Houdini rubbing his back against the hut post. Obviously, no one would get any sleep until he was re-tethered, so I wearily swung my legs out of the hammock and called softly to Charles to come and help catch him. For half an hour, Houdini cantered in and out and round the hut, while Charles and I, barefooted and half-naked, chased after him. Try and imagine that as a sight, trying to chase around this pig and try and get him back into his, into his leash, which he keeps escaping from. Finally, we collared him and retied him to his post. Houdini, apparently satisfied now that he had awakened the entire population of the village, gave a hollow chop with his jaws and settled down on the ground with a pineapple between his front legs. We returned to our hammocks to try and sleep through the last few hours that remained before daybreak. The journey back down river began well. We had constructed a large cage for the pickery and from thin saplings bound together with strips of bark and this was wedged in the bows of the boat. Houdini behaved perfectly for the first half hour. The curasso, tethered by a piece of string round its ankle, perched peacefully on the tarpaulin, covering our equipment. Tortoises rambled about the bottom of the canoe, parrots and macaws screeched amicably in our ears, and the Capuchin monkeys sat together in a large wooden cage, affectionately examining one another's fur. Charles and I lay back in the sun, staring into the blue, cloudless sky, and watching the green branches of the trees slip past us. Do you get the feeling that something bad's about to happen? But this did not last for long, she could prediction see. But this did not last for long, for soon we reached a difficult snag of logs. We climbed overboard and with our hands down began hauling the canoe over a submerged tree trunk. This was the moment for which Houdini had been waiting. Unknown to us, he had broken the fastenings of two of the lower bars of his cage and in an instant he jumped out of the canoe. I leaped into the water after him, nearly upsetting the boat, and after swimming a few yards managed to catch him by the scruff of his neck. He kicked and splashed and squealed at the top of his voice, but at last I got him back into the remnants of his cage. Charles began the repair work, while I stripped off my dripping clothes and laid them out on the tarpaulin to dry. Houdini, however, had obviously enjoyed his swim, and was determined to have another, so for the rest of the journey one of us had to sit by his cage, retying the bars as quickly as he loosened them. In the late evening, we arrived at, oh, what's that, Jawala, King George's own village, half a mile up the river from the Kukui King. There we spent the night, having secured Houdini to a specially long tether and quartered the rest of the animals in a derelict hut. The next day was our last before we had to return to Imbamadai. Most of the inhabitants of the village had been out hunting for the past week, but King George told us that they would return that day and sing Hallelujah in Thanksgiving. We had heard a great deal about this extraordinary religion which is peculiar to this part of South America, and which, as its name suggests, is derived from Christianity. Just in case you haven't heard the word Hallelujah, is like, I think, praise to God or praise be is what it translates as. Sort of an old thing that you often find in Christianity. At the end of the last century, a Macuzi from the Savannas visited a Christian mission. He returned to his tribe and then claimed to have visions during which he was visited, uh, which he visited a great spirit called Papa, high in the sky. Papa had said that he required worship by praying and preaching and told the man to return to the Macuzi people and spread the new religion which was to be called Hallelujah. The new beliefs were also adopted by neighbouring tribes from the Macuzi, so that by the beginning of this century it had spread to the Patamona, Aracuna and to the Akaweo, all Carib-speaking tribes and very similar to each other. The missionaries apparently did not realise the Christian foundation of the religion. Generally they condemned the beliefs that they found to be uh, as being pagan and they wholeheartedly opposed them. No doubt their opposition was intensified as ha when, as happened several times, new Hallelujah prophets declared that Papa had also predicted that white men would soon arrive preaching from books and offering contradictory versions of their own religion. To judge from the missionaries' fierce hostility, we thought it must retain many of the Mary Indians' old pagan beliefs, and we wondered what to expect on the hunter's return, a slightly warped version of Christian worship or barbaric ritual. We asked King George if we might film the ceremony. He agreed, and we settled down to wait. After lunch, we saw in the distance a woodskin canoe coming down the river. Thinking that it might be the first of the returning hunters, we strolled down to the landing to meet it. Ooh, so they're waiting for this religious ceremony to begin. The canoe moored, and we blinked in astonishment at the incredible figure who walked up the path towards us. From what we had heard, we had expected a slim, lithe Amera Indian in traditional clothes. 
Instead, we saw an old man wearing a pair of brilliant blue linen shorts, a shrieking sports shirt spangled with aggressive multicoloured designs representing, what's that, Trinidadian steel bands, and a Tyrolean felt hat complete with a white plume. This extraordinary apparition gave us a toothless grin and stuck his hands in his ultramarine trousers. Man, you say you, uh, man say you wish to see Hallelujah dance. Before I dance, how much dollar you pay? Before I could say anything, King George, who was standing with us, began indignantly shouting reply in Akaweo, gesticulating wildly with both arms. We had never seen King George so animated. The old man took off his hat and twisted it nervously in his hand. King George advanced on him, still fulminating, while the old man retreated backwards to his boat. He climbed in hastily and paddled back down the river. King George rejoined us, still panting. Man, he cried with great sincerity, I told that worthless fellow in that in this village we sing hallelujah for the praise of God, and that if he come to sing for money, then that is not true hallelujah, and we don't want him at all. Oh, that was quite a tense little bit, wasn't it? Just having a look ahead. Yeah, we've got a tiny bit more, but I don't think we've got time for it today. So what I'm going to do is end there and say thank you very much for joining us once again. And, uh, yep, hope to see you for part 16 very soon. Until then, there you go, I'll leave that as your final screenshot. Uh, why not look up some more of the animals that you heard encountered today? You can always double back through the video and find their names. And, uh, above all, stay safe and thanks for watching. Bye-bye.